Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone, and it's uh, good to see you all here today. So, we've been talking about we've been talking about the Lotus Sutra, and um, towards the end of the Lotus Sutra, the last few chapters, the last five chapters are thought to be more or less appendices that were added on after the Lotus Sutra proper. And last time we talked about Avalokiteshvara or Kuan Yin, since that chapter was devoted to that figure, that Bodhisattva. Uh, the next chapter is um, entitled Incantations. Incantations is the Jean Reeves translation of Dharani's. So um, we'll talk about this chapter a little bit. Um, first of all, what are Dharani's? The word Dharani is derived from the same root as Dharma, uh, D-H-R, uh, which uh, means something along the lines of uh, to hold or support. So um, the Dharanis are supposed to be supportive or um, supportive of practice. And uh, a Durrani is a vocalization. They're intended to be said out loud. Um, but they're not discursively intelligible in many cases. Uh, they can be. They can uh, make sense in the usual way, but uh, oftentimes the syllables don't correspond to actual words. And the power of the Durrani is thought to be just in the sound itself. These Duranis um, are intended to be memorized and oftentimes uh, said in rep repetition. Uh, again and again. Um, so it might seem a little unusual. Uh, we don't have anything strictly uh, similar in, in uh, Western culture. We do have some things that are somewhat similar, however. Um, we have memorizations that are intended to be vocalized to offer comfort and support, to offer protection, to calm the mind and quell fears. Uh, one might think of in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the 23rd Psalm, for instance, or in uh, Islam the uh, recitation of sections of the Quran in Arabic uh, are said to have a similar kind of function and effect. So the chapter on Durrani's, chapter 26, is divided into five parts and five different either individuals or groups are offering Duranis for the protection of those who read, recite, uh, respond, and receive and embrace the Dharma Flower Sutra to read, recite, receive and embrace 
the Dharma Flower Sutra or the Lotus Sutra. So, um, why, why is that out there? Well, um, clearly there were times that, uh, there, there have been times of uh, religious persecution throughout history, um, and um, there have been times when um, certain sects of uh, Buddhists, or just Buddhists in general, uh, have been persecuted. Um, so, and this <clears throat> occurred, I'm sure, in, in India, certainly in China and in Japan. But on, on a, in a larger view, um, there are just times of the need for protection, comfort, support, for other reasons as well. So these offerings of Dharanis were for that purpose. So as I mentioned, there are five of them, and the, the fifth is perhaps uh, the most unusual. And I, I think at this point, I'll, um, I'll just read that section talking about the fifth of the five Dharanis, and then we'll discuss a little bit and uh, go from there. At this time, some ogresses were there. The first named Lamba, the second named Villamba, the third named Crooked Teeth, the fourth named Flowery Teeth, the fifth named Black Teeth, the sixth named Much Hair, the seventh named Insatiable, the eighth named Necklace Holder, the ninth named Kunti, the tenth named Snatcher of the Spirits of All the Living. These ten ogresses, together with Mother of Demon children, with her children and followers, all went to the Buddha with one voice and said to him, World Honored One, we too would protect those who read and recite, receive and embrace the Dharma Flower Sutra, so that no weakness or illness will come upon them if anyone attempts to spy out the shortcomings of these Dharma teachers, we will prevent them from having any chance, they said. Then in the presence of the Buddha, they made the following incantation. E debi e devin e debi e debi e devin debi 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 roke 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 take 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 toke toke let trouble fall on our heads rather than on the dharma teachers neither satyrs nor ogres nor hungry spirits nor incubi nor succubi nor vampires nor ghouls nor lamias nor convulsives, nor satyr succubi, nor human succubi, nor fevers, whether the fever is for a single day, or two, or three, or four, or seven days, or unremitting, whether they are in the form of a male or a female, or of a boy or a girl, even in dreams, they will never cause them any trouble. Then before the Buddha, they spoke in verse. If anyone resists our incantations and makes trouble for a Dharma preacher, their heads will split into seven pieces like the branches of a basil tree. Their crime will be like that of someone who kills their father and mother, or someone who commits the offense of pressing oil, or someone who cheats with measures and scales, or someone who, like Deva, Devadatta, tries to divide the monks. Anyone who offends these Dharma teachers will have committed this kind of offense. After the ogresses had spoken these verses, they said to the Buddha, World Honored One, with our own bodies we will ourselves protect those who receive and embrace, read and recite, and practice this sutra. 
we will give them peace and comfort free from weakness or illness and quell the effects of poisonous plants. Uh, well, uh, some of that requires some explanation, I think. Um, first of all, ogres is a, a translation of the word um, rashaksh, I'm sorry, of rakshasi or rakshasas. Rakshasas or male, rakshasi or female. And Rakshasi are mythical figures who um, have certain magical powers, uh, often expressed uh, malevolently, uh, but not always. Sometimes they can be uh, beneficial, but oftentimes they are malevolent. The uh, mother of all Rakshasi uh, is a figure that is from, uh, I guess, uh, it's like a folk figure who is uh, who is called um, uh, Hariti. Hariti. And in Japanese, that's uh, Kishimojin. So, uh, who is Hariti? Uh, there are many, many folk tales about Hariti. And um, Hariti is, um, I guess, one of the uh, common tales that is told regarding Hariti and the Buddha uh, goes something like this. Uh, Hariti was someone who loved children too much and sometimes in the wrong ways. And she had, uh, as it is said, uh, 500 children. So um, she was, you know, passionately in love with her 500 children, uh, but uh, she didn't generalize that to other children and in order to it takes a lot of energy to uh, nurse and raise 500 children so uh, she um, had the practice of going into the village and uh, stealing other people's children and eating them and uh, this this caused great grief and consternation in the village and the villagers went to the Buddha and said can't you do something about this. So the Buddha went to visit Hariti and um, talked to her a bit. And while he was there, he um, hid her youngest child in his begging bowl and, and then took leave, left. Well, uh, she noticed after a period of time that her youngest child was gone and she fell into great grief over loss of that child. And she went here and there asking for help and uh, was instructed to go to the Buddha who might be able to help her. So he went, she went to the Buddha and um, uh, the Buddha said to her, Hariti, you are feeling tremendous grief at the loss of one of your 500 children. Imagine the grief that is felt by villagers who have lost perhaps their only child. And after saying that, he produced her youngest child and, and she went on her way back to her home.
But from that time on, she refrained from eating children and in fact became the protector of children and also the protector of uh, pregnant women um, and uh, a support for those going through labor. So that's one of the stories about Hariti. And to this day, uh, she is viewed by many in China or in Japan as being a protector and supporter of children. So that's one figure. They, they, I, I'll just mention uh, among the group who were offering this uh, Durrani was Kunti. And Kunti uh, was a mythical figure, a female figure, uh, from ancient Hindu traditions. So the, these Buddhist texts and the Buddha himself often interwove traditional beliefs and folk tales into his teaching uh, as a way of making it accessible for those who were listening to him. Many of the individuals, the lay people, who would be hearing the Lotus Sutra were illiterate, but they were very familiar with these tales just as we would be familiar with fairy tales, um, Grimm's fairy tales or whatever. So the use of these figures and these stories was a skillful means to allow people to relate to the message. And the message clearly is that of empathy empathy and compassion for others as well as oneself. And this is a, a theme that runs throughout the Lotus Sutra along with other themes. This story also speaks to the theme of universal redemption, that no matter how evil no matter what kind of evil deeds a person has engaged in, that they are destined for redemption. The Lotus Sutra would indicate that everyone is on the path to awakening, some more directly than others, some through a very tortuous path, but everyone universally is on the path to awakening. It's one way of looking at the world. And it's supported by such statements as, uh, do not despise those who have yet to learn. So um, obviously this is a story. Um, the story of Hariti is a folk tale. And you may not approve of kidnapping as a skillful means, but it, um, in the story, served the purpose of waking up, waking up Hariti to the fact that others felt just as she felt about their children. Uh, the Lotus Sutra in some ways, uh, I hesitate to say this because of the political implications, but in, in some ways it's, it's sort of one of the original uh, teachings of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. that of all these different beings, some human, many not human, the Buddha was speaking to them all. 
and regardless of how they had lived their lives, he viewed them as on the path to awakening and viewed his role as giving them tools, skillful means to move along in that direction. So as a result, Hariti transformed from a predator to a protector. I have a, a couple images here. Uh, this is a image of Hariti uh, that was uh, found in Gandhara. Uh, it dates back to the first or second century CE. And Hariti was uh, often depicted in this way with uh, sort of children crawling all over her. She, in this case, she has a, a child at the breast, she has one on her shoulder, uh, she has a couple at her feet, and she is carrying a fruit, typically a uh, pomegranate, because pomegranate was uh, considered a symbol of fertility with all those little seeds inside. So, um, and, and there are many, many depictions of uh, sculptures of Hariti uh, throughout Asia. And this is that uh, Durrani that um, the um, that the Rakshasas uh, offered to protect Buddhas. The recitation of this is um, again; these are usually committed to memory, and they are uh, they are recited in a particular way. I have a um, I hope this works. Uh, this is from a temple in Indonesia where the practitioners are reciting a portion of chapter 26 that includes the Durrani at the end. And you can recognize it when they get to the Debi, 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 Debi part. Let's see if this works. Stop that prematurely, let's see. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I kind of stopped that prematurely, but I think you get the idea. And um, so <clears throat> so how, do, how does how does this all relate to us and our practice? First of all, I think, uh, some of these rituals, these um, types of ritual that have been passed down over many years, um, many of them have been somewhat discounted in our current culture. But I, I, I think ritual has its place and a very valuable place in practice. Uh, when you think about it, Zazen itself is a ritual. 
you usually sit in a certain location in a certain way and go through a certain procedure to adjust posture and settle the mind. So it's a kind of silent ritual. And many of you may have things that you use as vocalizations, perhaps either aloud or, or in silence, to, um, to calm the mind. Uh, a mantra is sort of a short version of a dharani. And even memorizing a poem or a phrase even things that are kind of mundane, like, like follow the yellow brick road, you know, as a kind of device to calm the mind and quell fear. So, um, that's that's one thing, and I and I uh, I would be interested in also um, during the breakout rooms thinking about um, well the role of ritual, but also the story, the role of stories. And this notion of redemption that runs throughout the Lotus Sutra. Interestingly, uh, Harati sort of, just with the encounter of the Buddha, this single encounter, completely changed direction. Does that ever happen? Have you witnessed such a thing? Have you experienced such a thing? So I'll stop there, and we can uh, go into breakout rooms. And um, 